Tonight we agree to all of you in the name of Christ Jesus and pray that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ will be with you all. We greet those who are joining us through live stream. This is what we pray for you also. That you would receive the grace of God, the peace of God, and rule your heart. The joy of the Lord would be upon you. This will be our 14th lesson in the book of Amos. One of those prophets that received a message that was not the type of message that's preferred, but it's times when it's necessary. When the hearts of men grow hard, callous, insensitive to the things of God, they lose a sense of the meaning of judgment. They don't like to think about it. They tend to modify thoughts about it. They're quite willing to philosophize about judgment, which is like a game people play, philosophizing about truth. It's like the church version of Monopoly. Oh, it's phenomenal. When you see it, it's phenomenal. How much game playing is going on in the name of Christ. At any rate, when you philosophize about judgment, you never take it seriously. That's one of the handicaps of philosophy. It detaches value from what you're talking about. Neutralizes it. Makes it optional. Makes it not necessary. That's what philosophy does. That's why philosophers are generally very cold-hearted people. They're re also rather ignorant people, impractical people. Why? Well, because philosophy is of man and through man and to man. Now, God speaks to people like this about judgment. They don't take it too seriously when he speaks about it. Knowing this, and in Israel's case, he first of all announces judgment that's going to take place on people that are around him. Not on them. He tells them ahead of time who these people are. In the case of Amos, he names who they are, names the cities who they are. It's about the judges and the kings and the princes and the temples, and he tells all in the high places, and he tells what he's going to do to these people round about them. Because the people of God that he's talking to are lethargic. They're dozy. They've fallen asleep. Oh, but they can perk up when they hear about something happening to somebody else. That kind of kind of wakes them up. So that's what he's doing. That's exactly what he's doing. He sensitizes them to his judgment by drawing attention to other people that suffer it at his hands. And he knows that when he gets the attention of these people, a lot of them will say, well, they had it coming. It's about time. It's just about time something happened to those people. See, he knows that they're going to think like this, but they still, there's a little crack in their heart. <laughs> Happens so that he's able to work with them a little more. If you can get them to pay attention to God's judgment over there, it'll be easier to get them woke up about his judgment here. Amen. For the trusting one, uh, this is a, a gracious provision that you don't have to learn the first-hand method all the time. Yeah. This, I mean, this is a, if the only time you learn something is when the hammer fell on you, well, that, I'm glad it's not that way. Yeah. Each day, in view of this kind of arrangement, each day can be filled with glorious revelations about the nature of God. You, mean, you can see it in the neighbor, you can see it in the government, see it in the school system, you can see it all over the place. It may be blessing, it may be judgment, but you can see the hand of God all around you. Now, two times in Scripture, God is known as the God of judgment. Two times that statement is made. He's the God of 
judgment. That is, he wants to be known. He wants to be known this way. This is the only way I understand, but that he wants to be known as a God of judgment. You can't cross his path, violate his will, disobey his commandments, ignore his will, not go to him, not take advantage of his grace, and get by with it. You just can't. That's all there is to it. And that's in view of grace and everything else. That's the way it is. Those in Christ are warned. It is a fearful thing. Are you think a tornado's bad? It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Amen. Scary. Just say it's scary. Again, the people of God are the people of God are challenged. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? You going to take something that belongs to God and give it to somebody else, huh? You, you think you can get by with that? Do you really think this is God that loving? Is He? You got a Bible now full of, right. full of examples. That's what the jealous means. He takes something that belongs to him, like thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind, all thy strength. That's what you're to do. That's what the commandment is. But some people take that and they transfer it to sports. Amen. Athletics, entertainment, work. They transfer that to somebody else. That belongs to God. Amen. That's what agitates God. Provokes him. It's only his long suffering. Is, he, he's long suffering because he really doesn't want to harm people. It's not his preference. I mean, it's, it's not the servants of God. They're not trying to scare God's people. I mean, it, don't, don't get me wrong here. There's a, there's a lot more than being scared that must accompany your trip to glory. Yeah. But that's like a, a beginning. That's like an elementary class. When you're scared of God, I mean scared to offend him, then you can kind of move on to second grade. Pick up some other stuff. But if you aren't, you, you won't get any place at all. Yeah. <laughs> you, won't, you will not get any place at all. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. Yes. I've got some provoking comments here at the very beginning. Uh, in reference to philosophy, there's a difference between pseudo philosophy and true philosophy. It's a reasoning process based mm -hmm. on yep. knowledge. Well, when men begin with a corrupt foundation, they can only have a corrupt sure. product. That's right. I Amen. think of men like Voltaire, who after the manner of men was quite, you know, men would call him quite brilliant, but he was corrupt at yeah. the foundation. Therefore, he couldn't, he could not produce anything that would really be profitable men. If, if anything, he called down a greater condemnation on himself because the things that he did know he rejected mm -hmm. and then came to conclusions that actually provoked other men to move away from the truth and yeah. challenged God as though his intelligence was to be vaunted against heaven. But whenever we are called upon to make conclusions from these oh, things, yes. and that's Amen. what you're talking about there also, that whenever God produce this uh, his judgment against these other nations those with honest and good hearts would examine themselves mm -hmm. and say if you know is there any wicked way in me mm -hmm. have I been guilty of this what God is showing us something here am I right with God and as we're going through this series in Amos this isn't just an intellectual exercise for us either as we see these judgments that God mm -hmm. pronounced and carried out in all of these nations, and particularly in Israel. So judgment begins at the house of God. Amen. Yes. 
then we should take the more earnest heed at these things because we're we're sitting against a greater light if mm -hmm. if we are guilty in any of these areas. Amen. And we live in a generation where we're just we're adrift in this kind of a mentality. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Those in Christ are also that are lagging behind. See, this is what I hate about the modern church. Laggers are welcome. Did what I, I despise it. I despise anything that flies under the banner of Jesus that makes people that are lagging behind and dragging their feet comfortable. Because I happen to know they are in a dangerous position. Yeah, right. Now here's what God says about that. If we sin willfully, it's out of preference, after that we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remains no, now this is in the original language too, and it's in all the modern versions too. There remains no more sacrifice for sin. Amen. That's something that's not going to be covered. Yeah. That's what he's saying now. Yeah. Person may argue about it. Well, if they can, oh, that's not what he says here. He doesn't say they said willfully after they receive the knowledge of the truth, if they can only repent. That's not what he says. He says there remains no more sacrifice for sin. The sacrifice for sin doesn't extend into that area. Amen. That when a person prefers to sin, they're coming where they're going to drop off the edge. Yes. Yeah, God's people are told us. Well, what can they look for? What other, if a person does do that, what can they look forward to? He tells you. There remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a fearful, looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. That's what they got to look forward to. It's what he said. And you say, well, that's plain enough. Well, see, but even some people of God have gotten into a situation where like that's too startling. But you got to get to the point, if you're not, I think most of you are, know this already, but you, if you don't, you got to get to the point where you see the truth of that, that whatever it takes to stop sinning because you want to, whatever it takes, Amen. <laughs> you do it. Amen. It means pluck out your eye or cut off your hand. <laughs> Incidentally about that, there was a Franciscan monk that gouged his eyes out so he wouldn't lust. And he testified that after he gouged his eyes out, he lusted more than he did before. Now when Jesus said that, he wasn't speaking about, you know, cut off your head, plug out your head. He wasn't talking about... A He's talking about taking a, take away the thing that makes that happen. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Amen. If it's when you go out and sit on the back porch and you see stuff, then stop sitting on the back porch. Yeah, that's amen. kind of a practical way of saying it, but that's the way it is. Yeah. Through Christ, abundant provisions to um, crucify the flesh. He's made, that's he's, right. We have, all, we have every advantage that, that we could possibly have to get this job done. But see, it's going to involve, every, we're going to have to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow yep. after Jesus. That's just the basis of, of salvation is that has to be done first. Yeah. So this other thing, this, this um, coming to a point to where you can't be retrieved or, or God's not going to retrieve you, however you want to say it, is not something that just happens overnight. This is something of a continual ig uh, uh, ignorement of the provision of salvation. Yeah. This is not, this doesn't come on you like instantly. This is something that is, is cultured. Satan is culturing things around you that will do this if you let them. Yeah. But but salvation is designed to prepare you to, to, to where you can escape this kind of a situation. Yeah. Yes. Salvation is a moment by moment, yeah. hour by hour, day by day thing. 
Okay. Go ahead, Aunt. We're talking about denying ourselves. Yeah. yeah. I think that oft times that's heard like this. You really want to, but just don't let yourself do it. Just it's it's real it's hard. Almost like a martyr. <laughs> that's, just, right. You know, that's right. Well really, what we ought to be hearing is that part of us we don't recognize. Uh -huh. We deny it. Yeah. We yeah. we we denounce it. Mm -hmm. We willfully separate ourselves from it. That's the sense in which we deny yeah. it. We won't be part of it. We won't allow it to be part of us. We'll have none of it. Mm -hmm. We deny it. And whenever mm -hmm. your, your sinful nature tries to raise its head, then you count it, you reckon yourself dead. Mm -hmm. Now, Amen. just what kind of fellowship do you have? between the living and the dead. That's how much fellowship you have with that thing. Mm -hmm. You deny it. Amen. Just That's why you give advantage to the spirit and disadvantage to the flesh. Like That's you right. said, you, you disadvantage the flesh being able to do anything that you would uh, in the flesh desire to do that would be a sin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, people can't just get away by sinning. The Lord will take care of them. The Lord won't let them pass. The Lord isn't going to just say, oh, it's just one sin, it's fine. No, he no, he won't say that. I remember Brother Given telling me and, Ra me and Sister Rachel that one sin can send you to hell. The Lord will take care of those who sin. Yes, amen. <laughs> yes, Brother Jeremy. Uh, as you're speaking, I'm, I'm thinking of this is, see, this isn't something you could just put on a box. This is something that if this works for me, now I'm going to tell everybody else, you got to stop doing this. This is how it works for me. We, you have to keep close enough to the Lord to be able to be sensitive to whatever is, uh, is, is giving you problems. I'm reminded, and I've told this before, but when I met Nikki, we decided we're not going to go. We like to play pool, but we're not going to go to the pool halls anymore because that's the environment. We didn't want to be around it. So we bought a pool table and put it in our living room and invited people sensitive over to our house. Well, my brother came with a friend of his, and he said, I got to stop playing. And I was like, I didn't understand why. He said, it just reminds me of who That's I was right. before. <laughs> so I, it wasn't even, a, it was just a remembrance for him. Yeah. So me and Nikki thought we were doing good because we, we put a pool table in our living room and invited sensitive brethren over to play pool for this brother. Yeah. It was just a remembrance. Yeah. And he Amen. was sensitive enough to say, I just got to stop. For me, I got to stop doing this all together. Yeah. I can't play. Yeah. I but know what he meant. See, you you got to be sensitive. <laughs> if the Lord's telling you, stop doing it. Get out of the situation. Yeah, you I might know. be with it amongst brethren and say, I can't do this. I think I've, I've shared this with you before. I couldn't remember, but I've been thinking on this, the law of sin in my members. And I have difficulty holding on to things and knocking things over and things like this. And sometimes it really gets me and I say something. And it dawned on me, that's the law of sin just captured me. That's what happened. The law of sin captured me right there. And it put a kind of a new perspective. I'm still working on conquering that, but that. Well, anyway. I'm going to clarify that just a little bit. You're not saying bad words. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're just grousing around about no. it. Yeah, I don't let out some oaths. <laughs> Thank you for rescuing me there. Uh, this, this is our text, text for tonight. Remember the last thing God said was, I'm pressed unto you. You, you Israelites, you're, you're making me uncomfortable. Verse 14 through 16 of the second chapter. Therefore the flight shall perish from the swift, and the strong shall not strengthen his force. Neither shall the mighty deliver himself. 
neither shall he stand that handleth the bow. And he that is swift of foot shall not deliver himself. Neither shall he that rideth the horse deliver himself. And he that is courageous among the mighty shall flee away naked in that day, saith the Lord. All right, he's announcing a judgment here. There's a lot of things to see here. I must hasten on. It'll be apparent that the judgment rendered against Israel was not precisely like the judgment rendered against Judah. Now to Judah, he said, I'll send a fire upon Judah, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem. And that was pretty much the same type of judgment that was rendered to Damascus, Gaza, Tyrus, Edom, Ammon, and Moab. But the judgment revealed against Israel is going to be more detailed and more extensive because they sinned against more revelation. Judah did not keep the law of God, as stated, and caused many to err with her lies. That's bad enough right there. But Israel sold the righteous and the poor, exploited the poor, committed unspeakable morality, misused the pledges of others, drank the wine of the condemned, and in the house of God, drank the wine of the condemned in the house of God. They gave wine to the Nazarites, and they told the prophets to be quiet. So their sin is more extensive. <laughs> and so, so will the punishment be. Therefore, that's an expression of conclusion and necessary divine reaction. What follows happens because of what they did. So people will say, God doesn't pay attention to what you do. God pays attention to what you do. And here he's going to judge the people because of what they did. He's not judging them necessarily because of their heart, although their heart was the thing that produced it. He's not judging them for their thoughts, although their thoughts were corrupt. He's judging them for what they did. It were things that were seen. Yeah. There were things that brought reproach on his name. There were things that other people could behold and make erroneous conclusions about God. So what are you going to do about that, God? I'm going to visit him with judgment. And the, the flight shall perish from the swift. The other versions say the swift will not escape. Flight will be impossible for the quick-footed. The basic Bible English says, fast runners will find no refuge. Contemporary English Bible. New American Bible, flight shall elude the swift. Fast runners will find no place to hide. Your fastest runners will not get away. Your swiftest warriors will stumble in flight. There's no place to run no matter where you run. When Jesus foretold the destruction of Jerusalem, he told his listeners, when you see the armies gather around, let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. <laughs> A way of escape. Yeah. It was judgment, judgment from God. But they could get, if you saw it coming, you could get away from it. A place of safety would be found for them. When Jacob fled from Esau's face, he was, he was successful. David fled from Saul. He was successful. But when this judgment that God's talking about comes, even the swiftest runners of Israel will not be able to escape. The way of escape will be blocked off. There'll be no route out. You believe that you believe a judgment like that can happen where there's no way out? That's what he's talking about. Yes. Um, a minute ago, you just said that, um, the, um, that we're going to watch what we do. Um, Brother Jason mentioned in his, one 
one of the sermons that it does matter what you do in the world because God will hold you accountable for what you do or don't do. And this is a great example of God holding people mm -hmm. accountable for yes. what they have done. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Now this is an extreme judgment. Every judgment isn't this way. Sometimes, sometimes the judgment of Jerusalem way of escape. Okay? But not, not this one. That's not all that's going to happen. Not only will the, the person who can normally just run out of the thing, it's just because he's swift, he can get away, he won't, be able, he won't be able to do it. The strong shall not strengthen his force. The strong will not muster up strength. You know, some people get the fear comes and they come, they come to a new level of strength. If it's a runner, it's like a second win. If it's a fighter, they get over the hill. They get able to, they're able to mount up to a new uh, sense of strength. But they won't be able to do it in this judgment. The strong will not retain their strength. Their strength will pfft, it'll dissipate. That have increasing. Strong men will find their strength is useless. Samson's strength withered. Here's an example. Here's a concrete example. Normally his strength increased. But as soon as his hair was cut, it decreased. So they, he was not able to muster up enough strength. Once he divulged his secret, yeah. and don't cast your pearls before the swine. Amen. That's what he did. He put his pearls before the swine. Yeah. He lost his strength, and he couldn't muster it up. Normally, he just shake it. He'd just get up, he'd shake himself, and he gets strong. He got up, he shook himself, nothing happened. He just wore himself out. Yeah. There comes a time when a person's... I have to apply this now, see? <laughs> There comes a time when a person's education is of no value. No matter how extensive it is. Some people are gifted and they're innovative. They can think and work themselves out of almost any dilemma. But God can cause that forward-looking posture to fail and they won't be able to think the thing out or get the thing done. Their strength will fail. It's a judgment, see? God can cause a creative and powerful man like Nebuchadnezzar to lose his mind and wander like a slobbering beast in the field. Amen. Normally, this isn't the way he was. He just barged over everybody. No, he couldn't do that, taken away. No wonder this is said in 1 Samuel 2.9, He will keep the feet of his saints and the wicked shall be silent in the darkness. For by strength... Shall no man prevail. Yeah, the strength, the strong will not strengthen his force. So if God uh, does not keep a person, they aren't going to be kept. Amen. And their strong point will become their weak That's and right. vulnerable point. Why? When God withdraws. That's right. That's what happens. And I, that's not all. The mighty man will not deliver himself. That's the warrior, person who's accustomed to fighting, winning the battle, thinking things over. Sometimes uh, athletic contests, uh, be a strong person who'll take the game over. He's got that ability. God says this is a judgment that will not be able to, that will not happen. He said, don't let the mighty man glory in his might. It's Jeremiah 9, 23. Why? Because God can take it away. Amen. That's what he's going to do in this judgment to Israel. No one's going to be able to successfully address that judgment. Not for themselves, not for anybody else. That's how far Israel went. Samson was a mighty man. Endued with strength from God. But there came a time when God withdrew his strength. Yeah, yeah, right. And the mighty could not deliver himself. Uh, there it came, lived out. Goliath was a mighty man, huh? mighty warrior, yeah. but there came a time when his might could not deliver him. Amen. He had to be taken down by Ruddy David, yeah. young boy. Mm -hmm. There were two lion-like men of Moab, fierce, 
to take on all comers, but when they confronted Benaiah, mighty man of David, their strength departed from him, and he took them down. And at the same time, he knocked off a mighty Egyptian, took his Egyptian sword and killed him with it. What happened? Their strength. Oh, you got to see this. This is going to happen. Let it happen to our enemies, Amen. not our brethren, to our enemies. God can take their strength away so the mighty man can't strengthen himself. Men who are mighty by nature or even by divine enablement cannot sustain that strength. God has to sustain it. Think of the severity of this judgment brought upon Israel because of their transgressions. Mm -hmm. The best and the strongest among them would lose their abilities mm -hmm. during the judgment. Yeah. Mm. Normally devoted to the protection of the people, all these gifted people would just, just it'd take away, it would taken away from them, nothing they could do. Judah. God setting up and taking down as, that's, he, as he wills. That's nothing, right. Nothing man does can stop God yeah. from doing what he wills. Yes. Now, mm -hmm. maybe this is what's happened in our day. Yeah. That's what's happened maybe in the professing church of our day. Maybe this is what's happened. The people can't solve the problems in their churches. Mm -hmm. They try, but they can't. Yeah, yeah. They are wise, but not wise enough. They're strong, but they're not strong enough. Sin is blazing out of control in the church. Uh -huh. Why don't the strong come to, come to the aid? Because their strength has failed. Yeah. Their hair is too short. You've got to be able to apply this kind of stuff. That's what's happened. Swiftness of men, they, some might think, you know, if they escape the city, that they'd have an advantage, but Zedekiah couldn't say that. He fled the city. He left. He had his two sons with him, and it says they pursued him yeah. out of the city, and they killed his two sons, got his right. eyes out, they brought him back. So regardless See? of where you, might, where you might be, you're never at a place of safety when God is judging you. Amen. Amen. I think I was in this position myself, but castigating the church because it was weak and powerless. But I've kind of shifted my thinking on that. I think under the present circumstance, it's impossible for the church to surface. I think they can't regroup. I don't know how you. I don't know how you disprove that, because it's getting worse. This is a judgment. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Yeah. The church has dawdled around too long. They read about those churches in Revelation, Church of Asia. They read what Jesus said about it. They read what Je well, some of them did anyway, read what Jesus said about it. Well, this stuff is happening right under our nose. Yeah. There are mega churches that have immorality blazing like a bonfire in their presence. Yeah. Yes, because the strong can't strengthen himself and the swift can't run fast enough. They just can't work themselves out of it. They have workshops. They got conferences. They got all kind of correspondence courses. They got colleges. They got schools. They, they can't get away from this. Why not? They've been captured by their own iniquity. And God's made sure their strong points don't work anymore. All right, that's judgment number one. Dissipation of wisdom and strength. Here's judgment number two. Neither shall he stand that handleth the bow, and he that is swift of foot shall not deliver himself. Neither shall he that rideth the horse deliver himself. Now let's look at the word neither. It's a good word. It's an adverb that means similarly not or also not it means the prohibitions that were stated before 
extend on into this area also. T, punishment tends to expand like the iniquity that caused it. He that handles the bow, he won't be able to stand. The archer will not be able to stand, one version says. Or the bowman will not keep his place. See, ordinarily the bowmen, they kept the enemy at bay because they had arrows that shot long distance. So the enemy is like a half a mile away. They're shooting the arrows. They're retarding the progress. See, they're retarding the progress of the enemy. The enemy has this avalanche of arrows coming all the time, so they can't rush in like they normally would. But now their bows probably stopped working. Or the arrows veered off course. At any rate, the bowmen, <laughs> they couldn't do their job anymore. Yeah. Didn't work. Really yeah. And they also retreat when the enemy gets too close. That's right. <laughs> Gifted archers would suddenly become ineffective. As I said, maybe the bowstring broke. Maybe the arrows broke. Maybe they ran out of arrows, but whatever. They weren't, they weren't the advantage they were before. You can't identify the enemy either anymore. That's right. Mm. Not at all. It says, he that's swift of foot shall not deliver himself. Fleet-footed soldiers run fast. Fast runners. When the judgment actually comes, no individual will be able to escape, even though they're a fast runner. And under normal circumstances, they could outrun the enemy. They could, they could get away. See, when the Sabians came and took away all Job's oxen and asses, they killed all the servants, but one escaped. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ran to Job and told him. And when the fire fell from heaven and burned up all our Job's sheep and his servants, one servant escaped. Ran and told Job. Yeah. When the great wind smote the four corners of the house where all Job's sons and daughters were seated, eating and drinking, it killed all them and all the servants with them, except one escaped, <coughs> ran and told Job. Isaiah said there'll be a remnant that shall escape. But when this appointed judgment come on Israel, no such escape. Huh? No runner got out of that. It's not even the swift of foot. Solomon said this in one of his better moments. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift. I saw that. I saw that. The race is not to the swift. Neither shall I the battle to the strong. Yeah. See, there comes a time when God can take away what otherwise is an advantage, but he takes it away yeah. in his judgment. He said, um, yet favor to men, yet, let me read this text again. I returned and saw that under the sun that the race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, and yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. Chance, that's not chance, like dice chance. That word chance means the impact of what happened. They can't escape the result of what happened. Yeah, Brother Jason. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, it is possible for God to do this on an individual level too. And oh, yeah. Because the, the ultimate example, or the, the ultimate excuse me, the ultimate intent of when God judges his people is to produce some kind of repentance, discipline, so that they'll learn, they'll turn back mm -hmm. to him, sort of thing. Uh, and so I, I don't doubt that there are people who have amazing abilities or strengths or advantages or whatever, that God like neutralizes That's those right. things in their lives. That's right. I think you should be very careful about how you, you know, analyze these things because we don't always have an authoritative word on it. Yeah, it is possible that like 
There could be people who are like very strong people, so God makes them physically weak. Yep. Or yep. very smart people, he does the same thing. He makes them not able to use their intellect anymore. To produce some kind of... That these people might... See, they're, they're relying on those things. That's people right. who have these things rely on them instead of God. And so it's possible God, for the salvation of that person... Yep, take mm -hmm. it away. Take it away. Yeah, you're right. This isn't given for people to look at for this in somebody else. This is for this is you do this for self assessment, but believe me when I say God can do this. Because some of the smartest people in the world are the most ignorant people in the kingdom. They do the dumbest things. He make foolish the wisdom of the world. Made foolish the wisdom of the world. In the gospel he does that. The this, this thing of God making your strong point your weak point, that is something to to consider. Well, that's not, that, that's not all. Uh, he that rides on a horse, neither shall he that rideth on a horse deliver himself. That's a horseman, the best horseman. See, there were expert horsemen that could maneuver their way through a battlefield strewn with debris and probably dead bodies and a lot of other things. He could move maneuver that horse right through all that and escape. But he said he won't be able to deliver himself. Maybe his horse will fall down under him like Balaam's ass fell under him. Yeah, or the wheels will fall off the chariot. Like yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. Maybe his horse, maybe his horse would carry him under a tree like Absalom's mule carried him, and he yeah. hung him up on a tree. How this happened, how this worked out, we don't know. But this is a horseman that normally this was his strong point, yeah. able to. Get a horse, get a horse, and right out of the situation, he won't be able to escape. Again, uh, Psalm thirty-three seventeen says, "A horse is a vain thing for safety." <laughs> I mean, you 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 don't depend on horse on horses. The horse is prepared against the day of battle. Proverbs twenty-one thirty-one says, "But safety is of the Lord, not of the horse." Say, well, I don't worry about tornadoes. I have a safe room. Yeah. Is that right? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> now, Israel had already been warned by the prophets about this matter, about horses. Isaiah 31 1, he said, Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on, that means rely on horses and trust in chariots. Or, well, let's update a little bit, and trust in aircraft or yeah. nuclear war yeah. or you can throw in there whatever you want. Yeah. Woe to that person. Amen. It thinks on that. Religious men till have this tendency. Trust in natural things, even man-made things. Maybe it's unusual wealth. Trust in it. Maybe, maybe it's extraordinary health. A, a trust in it. Maybe advanced education, they trust in it. Or a network of wise friends, they trust in them. Yeah. Or it could be a large church, they, they trust in that. Or personal Bible knowledge, and they trust in that. Mm -hmm. Or the ability to quickly assess things and, and come up with a solution. Okay, your faith, if it's not in God, yeah. whatever you call faith, it's going to fail you. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. There are people, mm -hmm. they're dependent on something other than God. That's right. yes. Maybe they're dependent on their baptism. Maybe that's what they're dependent on. I've been baptized. Mm -hmm. So was Simon, the sorcerer. That's right. He was baptized too. Mm -hmm. Safety is of the Lord. And it's, here's what happened. Yes, go ahead. I just, I just want to reiterate, it's a good place to reiterate this, that the, the, the it's not that God is just mean and that he's, he just wants to, like, you know, yeah. get people. <laughs> this, yeah. this is actually could be viewed as a grace. If if this happens to men, this is an opportunity for them to turn to That's the right. Lord. That's right. That's right. And, and, and on, the, on the other hand, if they don't, 
God is also confirming something about the people. If God chastises a person mm -hmm. yeah. and the person doesn't respond, this is God. God's confirming something about yes. the condition Amen. of this person. Amen. He gave them a chance and they didn't respond. See, this, this just Amen. confirms. It's like the people in Revelation where it says he poured out all the judgment. He says, yet men did not cease to yep. worship the idols and mm -hmm. all the sorceries. They didn't stop. Yeah. Even though God judged those mm -hmm. things and caused them great pain, they didn't stop. Yeah. This is confirming, see, the state the state of those men. Mm -hmm. But on the, on the other hand, on the day of judgment, God can say, look, I, this was a grace that I gave you that you spurned. Yeah. I yeah. took away the thing that you trusted mm -hmm. in. You could have turned to me. And you didn't. You, That's right. Even in that, there's grace even underneath of that. Amen. Mm. Israel was told by Isaiah. See, they were warned about this tendency. It's Isaiah 36, 6. Lo, thou trustest in the staff of this broken reed, which was Egypt. Egypt was like a reed that was broken. <laughs> Whereon, if a man lean, it will go through his head and pierce it like he'd, it was broken. So you, you lean on this thing, and it's broken, and it runs through your hand, mm -hmm. drives a hole through your hand. Yeah, yeah. When you trust in something other than God, mm -hmm. and you lean it, this is what happens. You get hurt. Amen. When you depend on that. God will not compete with somebody else. Yep. Yet just nail this, nail this down in your conscience. God will not compete with somebody else. If there's two masters and you try and divide your allegiance, you'll default to the bad one. Yeah. And God will let you do it. Mm -hmm. That's just how God operates. Yeah. He will not compete. Amen. Why won't he? Because there is no other God. There, see, for him to compete with other gods, it would be like an acknowledgement that there was such a thing as other gods, but, yeah. but there isn't. Now Israel is told of a time when a diligent search for something to help will fail. But that's not all. That second judgment was swiftness and escape taken away. Now, how about this judgment? Courage is taken away. Oh, ho, ho. see, if a person can keep their courage, they can kind of survive. But he says, and that he that is courageous among the mighty shall flee away naked in that day. I, I sense that God is laboring to underscore the futility of trusted in anything but him. He, want, like he wants his people to know this. Yeah, it isn't as Jason said it is to me or an ogre trying to find a reason to destroy people. That actually he's seeking for a reason to save the people. Amen. You want to get right down to it. Yeah. Yes. Let's take some examples of someone that was courageous and then lost lost it. Achan. Achan was among an army that overran Jericho. It took some courage. Mm -hmm. And yet he, in the process of <coughs> overcoming Jericho, he spotted mm -hmm. a Babylonian garment, nice new suit, and, 20, and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold. Now God had told him, don't take anything. Yeah. Everything that's valued, like the gold and that, give that to the temple. All the good stuff goes to God. That's right. Don't take any for yourself. So it had been made quite clear. But he took it. And what was done to Achan afterward tells you how the courageous, what happens to them when they do the wrong thing. Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had and they brought them into the valley of Achor and all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire after they'd stoned them with stones. Oh, that's a big cost. What, what was, a, was a garment and a 20 pieces of silver and a wedge of gold worth that? Samson. 
We're talking about courage leaving you. See, Achan wasn't able to stand up against this judgment. He just <laughs> wilted. When the Spirit of the Lord left Samson, because he didn't know it had happened, he was no longer strong. See, the courageous flee away. He wasn't strong anymore. It is written that Delilah said to him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he woke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him, put out his eyes, brought him down to Gaza, bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. And there was nothing Samson could do about it. His courage left him. King Saul. When the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. His hold on the kingdom began to dissipate. And he ended up dead and in shame. He could not avert his downfall. The most courageous, he was a fierce warrior. The most courageous failed. He that is courageous among the mighty. Notice what he said. He that is courageous among the mighty. Other versions say the bravest of the warriors. He doesn't say he that's most courageous among the rest of the weak people. He that's courageous among the mighty. See, it's tender man's tendency to compare the strongest with the weakest. <laughs> that's not how it's done in, in Scripture. Yes. Sarah, as you've been talking about each of these men, how every time the Lord left them, something else left with him. That's right. Yeah. For an example, if you go to take a plant out of the ground, the, main, the only thing that you see before you get down the roots is just the plant. There are things that aren't seen below the ground, and how when you take all that out, you take out the plant plus all these roots that are below the plant that aren't normally seen. Mm -hmm. Now, each of these... The Lord took away the courage. He took away the resources he was giving to them and many other things that sustained them. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Yeah. Amen. Brother Kevin? Yeah. Yeah, particularly with Samson, as you were going through that, thing about him is he had, he had like, special, like, divine strength, you could say. Like, the things he could do wasn't anyone could do. You hand Goliath a job, and he couldn't kill a thousand armed men. And these are things that were, like, no one could do it. And so imagine after killing a thousand men, yeah. these men coming in to take him, it probably looked like a pretty easy task. Uh -huh. He probably thought, well, this will be nothing. Yeah. He's like, he probably thought of other things that he'd done, carried gates on his yeah. shoulders, but he couldn't even do that. That's right. He's like, he's not like his strength went down just a few notches. I mean, it went from the highest to lowest. That's you know? right. Yeah. Amen. So when the Lord departs, like, even the things that would appear to be easy, yeah. the easiest of tasks couldn't even be done without yeah. the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, I can see that. that um, when, when a person, you, you know, you're you're going along crucifying the flesh, but but you're not you, you're not um, dependent on your ability to crucify the flesh. You're dependent on the God who gives you the right. grace to crucify the flesh. Yeah. <laughs> not, it regimented systems uh -huh. of recovery yeah. don't teach you. That. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. I was considering those who are sensitive to the Lord can be or given an indication that judgment is coming so that they can prepare yes. and avert the coming judgment. Amen. So in these since in these examples there's a sense of obtuseness. Yes. That I keep coming back to the example of Samson that he wist not that the Lord had departed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They uh -huh. didn't realize this until the judgment was already upon That's them. Right. The judgment overtook them uh -huh. and yeah. then they were able to escape. That's Amen. right. Amen. Amen. We, yeah. I was also considering, you touched on earlier, about this state that man can be in where they're beyond recovery. Mm -hmm. And just adding to that, that I th part of what makes it so dangerous is that the person doesn't even know that. Yes. They have absolutely no they're idea sure. they're in that state. He doesn't know it till, he, till he's in a Until condition that calls for the exercise of power uh -huh. he once knew. Yeah. Yes, now, the, the courageous among the mighty... That's like the comparison of David's 30 premier soldiers 
with the rest of his army, which were all extraordinary soldiers, but there were 30 that were like, they were yeah. <laughs> courageous among the mighty. And then among the 30, there was three that yeah. were, <laughs> there were three that were greater than the, than the 30. Yeah. The mightiest, the uh, most courageous among the mighty. Yeah. There were the disciples, uh, there were the multitudes of people, there were the disciples, then there were the three, and then there was Peter. See, so that, that's great, the, the strongest and the mightiest. And how would these brave, courageous soldiers respond to this judgment of the Lord? They shall flee away naked. Other versions emphasize he's not talking about stark naked or without clothes. That's not what he's talking about. The New Jerusalem Bible says he will jettison, throw overboard his arms, and run away that day. New Living Translation says he'll drop their weapons and run for their lives. The idea is not merely run away without clothes. I, the idea is these weapons are no good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They'll treat the weapons like they, threw, like they treated the wheat on board that ship that Paul was on, remember? They threw the wheat overboard. It, Normally, this is necessary to sustain life, but time of storm is worthless. Pharaoh's army regretted their armor. Oh, when yeah. The Red Sea fell. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, that's right. To a soldier, that weaponry was important, yeah, yeah. but when they didn't have courage, it was useless. Now, this explains a lot of people's dilemmas. The church is in a condition now that agitates the head. I'm afraid he's having to say too often, I find somewhat against thee. Yeah. Yeah, there were just a few churches, mm -hmm. three churches that he said that to, or the seven. But I have some. Something against you. <laughs> See, too often today, infractions against God's will are growing mm -hmm. among professing Christians. So God sent armies against them mm -hmm. that scare them. Yeah. I'll name some of these armies that have come against the church, and the church hasn't been able to, has not been able to do anything about it. There's been some people who have risen up and tried to, tried to do something about it and said good things, but they've not been able to get rid of these enemies. How about government? Government's raised up, passed new laws, wasn't a thing the Christian world could do about it. Everybody got on the phone, they called the senator, they had workshops, they had people, they still passed the laws. They didn't retract that thou shalt not pray. They didn't retract don't pray in Jesus' name. None of these laws have been retracted. The educational system. It's risen up against the church. Field of entertainment. Risen up, it's out competing for the attention of the church and the dreadful engine of organizationalism. These are like Midianites. Philistines, Syrians, and Chaldeans that have successfully oppressed the church. Why? Because the church is dead. Yeah. Nobody looks at today's contemporary church and even thinks about God. Yeah. Yeah. And if someone says they do, they just are uninformed and simplistic yeah. people. Uh -huh. This is not the way it is. If in a government circle someone rises up and says they're a Christian, they laugh. Yeah. If a media man comes on and explains a storm by saying that God's judgment fell, he's made he's mocked. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. What's happened? Yeah. The courageous among the mighty, yes. yeah. they don't have any influence. Yeah. Uh -huh. It doesn't mean they're not good people. They just don't have any influence. What is that? God's level to judgment. Yes, 
You didn't hear from me? So I'm going to send you strong delusion. So you'll believe a lie. And I'll damn you because you believed it. And I'll be just in doing it. This is how God operates, brethren. For those who can see it, the church is being held hostage by its enemies. What's the answer? Well, we pray there's a godly person who will rise up, but God said of Israel, though, he said, even if, I, even if Noah and Job, you know, prayed for Israel, I would, I, they'd only deliver themselves. I wouldn't hear them. It can get, things didn't get that bad. We've got a record in Scripture of it getting that bad. Yes. On this matter of the warriors casting off their, their weapons and the thing that they used to fight, I, th- I thought of a text that says, if God be for us, who can be against yes. us? Mm-hmm. It can also be said that if God be against you, then no manner of physical right. warfare yeah. will deliver you yeah. out yeah. of the hand of God's wrath. Amen. Who can be for you? Amen. Yeah. Brother Given, uh, yeah. in the book of the Revelation there, it says to, for them to repent, or he would take away their candles to yeah. Now, Now, they, they could repent until he took away the candlestick. Yeah, but once he took the candlestick away, there wasn't any more opportunity to repent. That's right. Mm-hmm. It was a done deal. See, these things are written for our admonition yes, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Yeah, right. God lived out in the nation of Israel the, the doctrine uh-huh. pertaining to man's relationship to him. It was lived out in history. That's right. And it necessarily when the grace of God hadn't been revealed. It had to be at that kind of a period. You can, you can surely see the sense of that. This had to be demonstrated in a graceless mm-hmm. period. Mm-hmm. Just one more thing. We mentioned the Egyptians being sorry for their armor when the Red Sea was coming down on them. Our armor doesn't slow us down. That's right. It helps us fight. It helps yeah. us fight That's better right. because God gave it to us. Mm-hmm. Yes, Brother Jason. Yeah, in, in the end, you I can see that in the end, there will be people in hell who are in hell simply because they chose something other than God. That's mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. It, it, do, it doesn't really matter what it is. It, does, it doesn't have to be something grossly immoral Amen. Or, right. or inherently Amen. evil. Uh-huh. Amen. It could be something like family oh, yeah. or nation or... Mm-hmm. It could be. It could be anything other than God. This is. This is what they trusted in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And of course, God's reminding us too. These are things you can't keep anyway. Yeah. No, nobody's keeping any of these things. Mm-hmm. That's right. Whether it be strength, if you're if you're young and strong, there's going to come a day when you're old and weak. Yeah. <laughs> if you have a lot of money now, there's going to come a crash, and you're not going to have any more money. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, death is the ultimate leveler. That's yeah. right. Uh-huh. Amen. Good. Humanity. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. a good statement. So death we, is the ultimate leveler. So mm-hmm. these, so God, God's like reminding people. People, people are getting remind. They should be getting catching these reminders. See, mm-hmm. That's right. That they can't keep these things, but but people will hang on to these things mm-hmm. till the very end. The, Pry their dead fingers off of these things. Yeah, amen. You know? And and that that but ultimately that's going to be the difference between heaven right. and hell. That's right. People in heaven are people who chose to trust uh, trust the living God. I no choose Him. What. And hell be people who chose something else. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. kind of that simple. If that meant I'm going to have to sit at the gate of a rich man and beg. Mm-hmm. But this this um, topic of judgment. Is very uncomfortable for most most mm-hmm. people, and it's it's very easy whenever judgment is being spoken of for people to turn around and and judge the judgment, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But you you put yourself in two camps. Whenever whenever God brings a judgment. On yourself or on, as in this case, uh, we don't know any of these people personally, but we know these things happen. Mm-hmm. We're, we're like being made privy to the judgment that was upon them. So it's not us personally 
saying, you know, well, they're not nice people or blah, 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 whatever. We're seeing God's view on this. Mm -hmm. Now, God is merciful. Mm -hmm. And whenever he judges something, it, you, it can become either a chastening to you, in which case he, he's a consuming fire. It's like he's burning the dross out of mm -hmm. you. You're you're actually being separated from the thing that that causes God to condemn, mm -hmm. and, and in which case you've been you've been chastened, and then you can be received. But if you won't receive the chastening, if you won't pay attention, if you won't give heed, then you become a partaker in that. So as you yourself become kindling, so to speak, yeah. for the fire of God. You're gonna, you're gonna drink the dregs of the judgment. You're going to own the judgment without any kind of recovery, because you have chosen to, to affiliate with and to partake of, imbibe whatever. But you're identified with the thing that God condemns. Mm -hmm. You weren't turned from it. Amen. I wanted, I wanted to say this also that. He judged this just generation of Israelites, but he did not extinguish Israel. There was a remnant preserved, and it would later surface. The same as in the church, there's been generations where severe judges have been poured out, but he did not eliminate. He didn't eliminate the church. There's still this remnant. Now, it's my persuasion that we are living in a rejected generation. It's, that's my own personal persuasion. There's exceptions to the rule, but as a whole, this generation is done. But there's but another generation will rise. Amen. There'll be a Timothy and a Titus, and so, at least, but another generation rise that will look back on what's happened, like Daniel looked back yes. and Nehemiah looked back. They looked back and saw what happened, and it it compelled them, yes. see, to go forward. So this is another reason for keeping the faith. This generation may be written off, but if you keep the faith, there'll be a reputation that'll be carried yes. forward. Yeah. Now, it's a matter of judgment in people's minds today. People object to this idea of judgment because they somehow they've gotten the idea that God, God is just He's just being hard on well-meaning people. <laughs> that that people, people are just doing their best, and God's just so picky. If God weren't so picky, weren't so hard on people, see, mm. then it's just, that's the way judgment's kind of viewed. You're, we're told, don't be judgmental. You're just being, you know, you're just being hard on people. Yeah. That's right. But see, Jesus Jesus said that light has come into, this is the judgment, light has come in the yeah, Lord. See, judgment is really the revelation of the truth of the matter. So, in light, so when God, like, when he judges, he takes away the strength of man, he takes away what man trusts him. Well, the, the truth is those things are are inferior to God anyway. That's yeah. right. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so when so when God judges, he's just showing what's already true. It's just Amen. that men aren't willing to see it. So yeah. on like on the day of judgment, for example, it's gonna be made manifest that everything else is inferior to God. That's and right. that's just uh -huh. the truth of the matter. Amen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> And that's just going to be brought to light. So you might as well just come into the light now. Yeah. Yeah. That's See? right. You that's might right. as well just come hey, into the light now. In a sense, if you do that, you've already passed through the judgment. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, so the day of judgment, like you've said this many times before, the day of judgment is not really going to determine anything. Yeah. yeah. The day of judgment is just going to, everything's going to be brought to light, like flipping on a light in a dark basement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's the truth of the matter, See. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Amen. Amen. Yep. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the words of Scripture, uh, if you would judge yourselves, you'd not be judged, yeah. come to mind. And this is opportunity. Now, we're taking these things that some people would say are just like ancient information. Mm -hmm. And yet, if we will give heed and we will judge ourselves carefully, <coughs> well then, even though we are, in a crooked and a perverse nation, if we will judge ourselves, 
then this this judgment of God, we may bear some of the the burden of the judgment. You know, it's not like we're going to go unscathed. We're in in this generation. There are going to be ramifications to being in such a generation as this, but we won't be judged the way they're judged. Yeah. We'll be saved. We'll so be is by saved. Fire. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yes, yeah, Sister Emma. Yes, when you brought up Saul, I was, I was thinking of when, as soon as God left him, um, a spirit immediately came and it attacked him. So I was thinking, hmm. it's like you're out in a battlefield and you take your armor off. As soon as you take your armor off, people are going to be aiming at you and you will get hurt without God. That's right. Very good. Amen. Silas? Whenever you pointed out that some people say God doesn't watch what you're doing, if God really doesn't watch what you're doing, then why should he be judging and punishing you? Mm -hmm. And if he doesn't just punish you because he wants to, he has a reason for it, and that's because he is watching you. Mm -hmm. That's right. Amen. Yes, Brother Paul. Mankind by nature cannot fear beyond that which they can see or know. So I, I, yeah. I this point that Brother Jason brought up about this being a mercy, is that this is teaching the fear of the Lord. Mm -hmm. it, it, the, the, we're, te we're learning how to fear God, who, uh, after he hath killed the body, he has power cast into hell. Now, he's, he's giving a judgment now. Now, you, you think the judgment here is bad, mm -hmm. or you think the judgment here is good. Well, then there's another extension of that awaiting you beyond. Amen. So either it's going to be even worse, or it's going to be even better. Amen. All right, we'll close there. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the testimony of our judgments. We also are grateful that you have revealed your grace and your gracious intentions for those who trust in your Son. We pledge ourselves now before yourself, before angels, and before men that we will follow on to know the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.